Thanks, James and Jules. Uh, there's so much going on, and it's so great uh, to hear about it, and uh, especially as we come up to the lead to Christmas and all the excitement that's going to be there. And we're going to be launching that over the next few weeks and giving you all your dates uh, for the diary for that as well. As James said, my name's Dan. I'm the uh, vicar here at St. Peter's. And uh, today, I want to speak on the topic of blessing in the battles, blessing in the battles. We all face battles in life. Uh, We all face challenges. We all go through tough times. Uh, But if you're like me, sometimes you can kind of fall into the trap of thinking, I've just got to hang on. If we can just hang on long enough, maybe eventually I'll get through this. And then on the other side of this problem, maybe then I will get to experience uh, a season of blessing. And whilst God does bless us at the end of battles, actually what I, what I believe, what I've encountered in my life, what we're going to see in our reading today is that God wants to bless you in the midst of the battles and not just at the end. Uh, We are finishing today our our speed tour through Psalm 23. Uh, You probably have heard of it in some way. It's probably one of the most famous songs and most famous prayers in the world. It was uh, written by a guy called David, who was one of the kings of Israel, but he started life in in a really obscure place as a shepherd. And he's a guy who experienced real battles. And he also experienced real blessings in those battles. And he speaks so powerfully of it in this prayer. Now, the first uh, half of the psalm, which we've been looking at the last two weeks, Holly and then myself, um, uses this image of a, a shepherd with their sheep. And the picture is that God is our shepherd and he wants to guide us towards blessing. But the second half of the psalm has the picture of a server with a table. And this is the picture that tells us that God doesn't just want to serve us at the end of the journey, but he wants to serve us and bless us all the way through the journey. And the line we're going to be focusing on is this, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Um, As you uh, may know, uh, my wife Kate and I, we used to live in Malaysia. And uh, if you ever get to go to Malaysia, amazing country. But one of the things that's really helpful to know is that one of their love languages is food. And in particular, it's feeding other people their food. They are so proud of their food. Kind of like how some cities here are proud of their football teams. They are proud of their food. And so a lot of conversations go, have you tried this food? And you say, no, I've never even heard of that food. And they say, well, you must try that food. And the only place to try that food is this place. And you must go now. Like, you must go now, because you might miss out. It might be sold out. And so we were having one of those conversations, and the conversation of that day was about something called bakute. Bakute is just this incredible Malaysian speciality. It's like a a pork rib broth. It's incredible spices that I'd never even imagined in my life. It's cooked, I think, for days to get it ready. And, uh, And they were like, have you tried bakute? And I was like, no, I haven't. And they were like, well, you have to. And the only place you should go to try it is Uncle Arweng's on the old Klang Road. And, so, and they were like, we, we must go now. So they took me. Now, what I hadn't realized was the old Klang Road is basically like the M25. And um, when they said it was on old Klang Road, They literally meant it was on Old Klang Road. Literally every night, Uncle Ah Weng would basically do a pop-up restaurant. And there's not much space there. So he would take over the hard shoulder and set his kitchen up. Then on the inside lane, he would put the tables. And on the middle lane, they would put, uh, you could park your car, so you got good access. And then the, the fast lane was still a fast lane with cars coming past at 80 miles an hour. So, so we get there, and this place is so popular, it's packed out. And I'm like, well, okay, like, fortunately, we're not going to be able to eat here. I'm going to be safe. But then out comes Uncle R. Weng with this, with this round table. He just rolls out and he says, there's no space here. So I'll just put you like on the middle lane, like in, in the car park next to the fast lane. My friends all just sat down like this is normal and uh, out comes the food and I'm sat down. A table has been prepared for me in the presence of oncoming traffic and, <laughs> and my appetite left. 
I was quite distracted. And I have to say, I didn't really try much bakute. I missed out that night on possibly the best bakute in Malaysia. And I have, I have to admit, I went home and afterwards I cooked a frozen pitiful pizza. It was, uh, it was just, it was not a, uh, a successful end to the evening. A table has been prepared for us in the presence of our enemies in the presence of our oncoming enemies. And sometimes with all the noise, with all the fear that that can bring, we can miss out on what God is doing right in the middle. The blessings that he wants to give us in the middle of the battle. Because the blessings he has is he has new tastes, new delights that he wants us to taste and try. And we're gonna see what that looks like in Psalm 23. Let's have a read of this. It's going to come up on the screens. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff They comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. The opening lines of that psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, make an astonishing claim. Like an absolutely outrageous claim. Do you know what? If they weren't true, if God hadn't inspired David to write those words, it would be incredibly arrogant of him to have written them and pretty much blasphemous for us to repeat them. The the Lord, i.e. God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of all things seen and unseen, the starter, the finisher, the one who gives us life, who, who did everything, that God, that Lord is my shepherd. And let's be clear, that is not a compliment. Like a shepherd back then was hard, bitter, and dangerous work. This was lowly work, not not for the high in society, but in the low of society. Like this wasn't a job that you would like boast about, like on LinkedIn, this would be the job you upspin, like mobile nutrition and protein textile provider, shepherd. Uh, Like, like, This isn't like, imagine this in any other sphere of life. This would be like saying, Messi is my football coach. Lewis Hamilton is my driving instructor. Beyonce is my singing teacher. Brene Brown is my therapist. Pope Francis is my prayer partner. Kim Kardashian is my social media manager. Spike Lee uh, is my uh, TikTok maker. Jimmy Choo is my wardrobe consultant. Evidently not. Uh, Mary Kondo is my housekeeper. And Mary Berry is my cooking instructor. Like, think of the, the, the master in any field and then imagine them coaching you as you begin and set out in that field. And that is not as gracious or as generous a, a, a humbling as to even begin with comparing with the Lord is my shepherd. Our God is humble. He humbles himself to shepherd us. But then also what this says is in humility, he serves us. You prepare a table. He guides us towards blessing, but he also serves as blessing on the way. Like that word server there, like it's like a, a somebody who is a servant of a house back then. Like anytime you go to a restaurant uh, and there's a waiter or a server or a barista, God is saying, I am like that person. Only in the ancient world, that was like the lowliest of work. That was servant work. God says, I'm, I'm like that. He humbles himself to serve us. Like, Let's, let's act this out. We've got a table. We've got a table here. Okay. And uh, God is going to prepare a, a table for us. And I'm going to need, I'm going to need somebody to help me today. Okay. Everyone looking a bit nervous. Oh, Chris. Chris, come, come and let's give Chris a warm welcome. Chris, Chris has been having a hard time. And so God, 
is going to prepare a table for him. Have a seat, Chris. Does, does that feel good? God is going to prepare this table for you. Does that feel nice? Good lighting? Except that isn't what this verse says. This verse doesn't say that he will take us out of our problems and prepare a table for us. It says he has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. So Chris, can you, can you help me? We're going to move this down. Actually, James Bailey. It's James Bailey. There we are. There we are. Health and safety. Here we go. And we're going to bring this down. And we're going to put this here. Now, for, for the uh, purpose of these illustrations, you are now Chris's enemies. I know you love Chris. Uh, Chris, let's, let's put Chris to one side. Can you give me maybe a, a growl or a roar or a... Yeah, there we are. Great. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, we can have those tables around there. And so God is going to prepare a table for Chris in the presence of his enemies right here. You know, often we want God to airlift us out of our situation, but actually he wants to send supplies in. And here we, we have them. James Stinson and his merry band of servers are bringing right into the middle of Chris's tricky situation a banquet, <laughs> food, possibly some of the most amazing. We've got artisan bread. We have, we have Skylark coffee from Bloom. Oh, we have, we have uh, a, 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 is this, is this double, shot, double shot latte, oat milk? Yeah, extra hot. Photo of Chris's face in the, in the foam. Yeah, great, brilliant. God has provided a lavish banquet for Chris. And Chris, please enjoy. Please enjoy. <laughs> now the question is, why here? Why here in the midst of our enemies, in the presence of our enemies? Why is it that he doesn't just get rid of everyone or take us out? And there are a few reasons. Now, sometimes it's because we don't want our enemies destroyed. No, no, yeah, please, please. This is, this is what the Lord does with us. Now, the first reason is because we often don't want out. We don't want to be taken out of our situation. Maybe we want our enemies to become our friends. Now, I have to say here, be really clear on this. If there are situations that God does take us out and puts us in a table out of our situation, you know, those extreme ends of things. And just want to be really clear today. If you or anyone you know is experiencing anything like domestic abuse or violence or threat in any of that way, God wants to get them out. And you should help people out and you should get out. And we have a team here. We call them the safeguarding team. You can find their numbers around. They're there to talk with you or help with you. Um, and they will work with the police to make sure people are safe. But not all situations are like that. Not all situations are in the... Like, let's imagine that this is Chris's workplace. And Chris, you, you love your work, don't you? you love, you're passionate about your work. So if Chris is having a hard time in his work, perhaps he doesn't want God to take him out of his workplace. He wants him to provide for him in the workplace. Or maybe it's a relational challenge, a relational battle that you're facing, maybe with, with your spouse or with a child. You don't want that relationship to be broken. You want God to provide for it in the midst of the battle. And the promises that we get in Psalm 23 is that he will. I'm going to leave you to enjoy that for a moment. Um, one of our other culture shocks when we went to Malaysia was... Um, around food again. Not just the quality of food in Malaysia is incredible, but the quantity is unbelievable. Um, I'd never been to a Chinese wedding banquet, and so I had no clue what to expect. And in case you ever get to go to one, basically you need to know the food keeps coming. The food just keeps coming. Um, now, growing up in the UK, you're taught if, if a host puts food on the table, you have to eat it and you have to finish it. And it would be rude not to finish that, right? Yep, so, uh, but nobody had told me that that is not the case in Malaysia. So I went to this wedding banquet, the first course came out, and I was like, this looks good, and so I, I ate it all. Then the second course came out, it was larger, and so I ate it all. The third course came, I was, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to struggle with this, but I managed to finish it, it was hard, but at least I was being polite. Okay, most, most important value. And uh, by the fifth course, I was in a bit of pain. By the sixth course, I was like, Lord, you need to come and get me now. I need to be airlifted out. By the seventh course, 
I nearly died. And then I was like, that's got to be it. And they were like, surprise, here comes the eighth course. And I was like, please let it be lemon sorbet. And out came the noodle dish, this enormous thing, the biggest thing I've ever seen. Only then did somebody say, you're not supposed to eat it all. It took me about a week to recover. See, at that kind of wedding, the hospitality and generosity of the host is far greater than the needs of their guests. And that's a picture of God's generosity towards us. Our cup overflows. Now, maybe you're thinking, Dan, actually, you say that, but I feel like in my life, it feels like God hasn't provided yet. Or it feels like he's only provided enough. And I would encourage you to to look back to what we thought about last week, that we struggle with his guidance, with the journey, uh, the destination, the route, and the speed he takes. But he knows what he's doing. Uh, And I want to encourage you to keep going. Stay faithful, uh, because the noodle dish is on its way. God is going to provide. And what his promise is, even when we don't see it, he is preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And he does that because he wants them to see. He wants them to taste. And the thing is, we get to be part of that. This is the second reason he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies, so that others can be blessed too. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And he does this because he wants the enemies around us to see how good he actually is. You know, last week we talked about God glorifies himself through us. He he leads us not to make a name for ourselves, but to live for his name's sake. Because that is a way to see his goodness in our lives and also those around us. We we also shared uh, that we'd seen this family member recently go through this horrifically tough time. And God had kept providing for him. Like, and we just couldn't believe it because he was the injured party, but it's like I was the one struggling at night, having like vengeful thoughts and writing angry letters in my head. And he was able to be gracious and generous and kind. And I was annoyed on his behalf. And it, we just couldn't believe it. God kept pouring out this grace and generosity into his heart. And, and I just watched it. And what it made me think was, wow, God is good. And wow, I don't know how he's doing that, but I want him to feed me like that. That's what God wants to do in any time you're going through a hard time. He wants to use that to be a sign for those around you. Do you know, whenever Jesus tells us to do something though, he always helps out. You know, he he never like, he he always pays for what he orders. He never goes into a restaurant, orders food and then runs off without paying the bill. He helps us do what he asks us to do. And some of the food that he's put on this table that Chris is enjoying, uh, some of that food is the fuel to be able to forgive. He asks us to forgive people and he then helps us to do it. So, Okay, let's, let's go back down. So say Chris is in his workplace and uh, somebody's undermined him in his work. They've betrayed his, his confidence. Now, if he now just walks out, oh, sorry there, Ian. Um, he, uh, he's now doubly down, isn't he? Because he's lost the job he loves. He's lost uh, relationships. Um, and, and the Lord says he wants to help you to forgive. Now, the first way he does that is he helps us with the desire to forgive. Because I don't know about you, but often my first prayer has to be, Lord, I want to forgive. Lord, I don't really want to forgive them, but Lord, I want to want to forgive them. And actually, as you start to pray that, you'll notice that your desire to want to forgive comes. And then you're actually able to forgive, which is a great way of understanding forgiving is going to the place of former giving, that in appropriate ways, you're able to then offer some of the goodness in your life back to them. So uh, would you like to offer one of your enemies uh, a bit of, bit of your food? You, you do want to. You want to offer some, not really. Chris wants it. There's not, there's not enough for Chris. Ah, how, how about behind, behind you? Why don't, why don't you offer some? Ah, look at this act of forgiveness. No, no, just one. Ah. Okay, yeah, all the enemies, all the enemies. We're going to need that. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll stop it there. No, no. It's not gluten-free. No, no, sorry. Sorry, it doesn't say that in the psalm. No. No, maybe, maybe I'll have to, have to look at the Hebrew. Um, and, and so you offer forgiveness. Maybe that's in 
carrying on the relationship, not repaying like for like. And then sometimes the overflow of that is reconciliation. Would you, would you mind coming to join? No? No? Are we going to pass? Who would like to join? Ian. Uh, Ian, will you join? Will you come and sit at the table with us, Ian? Ian's going to come and join us at the table. And this doesn't always happen. But sometimes the Lord allows reconciliation to take place. Because Jesus is the God who turns enemies into friends. And sometimes those enemies, it's right and appropriate that they come and they live in relationship with us. And Ian, you can now enjoy that food with Chris. Now this usually happens when somebody realises, wow, I treated you like this and I served you up junk and you repaid me with food. First of all, where did that food come from? And also, why on earth would you do that? This is living in a way that people start to ask questions for which the only answer is Jesus. And one of the most powerful ways we do that, powerful places, is is in this area of forgiveness. This is what David means when he says, my cup overflows. I um, I remember the first time I ever went um, to Nando's. Oh my goodness, I was amazed. I had never seen such a place where you get a soft drink And it's bottomless. Like that just blew my mind the first time I went. I grew up in Gillingham, sheltered life. Um, And uh, we don't have a Nando's there. And uh, it it blew my mind because you could drink this soft drink and then you could go and refill it. And you could drink it and refill it. And you could keep going as, as much as you well, physically, the fizzy drink would allow you to do. And then you're like, well, I've got so much. My friend didn't order a drink, so I can give them some. And then the staff said, actually, you're not supposed to do that. But your cup overflows That is what Jesus wants to do for us in our life. With him, our cup keeps overflowing. As you forgive, you discover you have more power to forgive and more power to extend that into new ways. And and with Jesus, you are allowed to share it with your friends. Now, your enemy may not be sitting, may not be walking with Jesus. They may not have a table where they have free access to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of the fruit of the Spirit. And as we receive it, we can share it with others. Because Jesus is the God who turns enemies into friends. And we've already experienced that, haven't we? Because that's what he did for us. This is the third reason he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies is because often we act like our own worst enemy. You know, it's mad, isn't it? We don't always act with our own best interests at heart. The current me often doesn't seem to consider the future me. You know, we choose things. We know that they won't work. We know that they won't satisfy. We settle for lesser loves. Um, You know, the heart of the issue that Jesus teaches us in his word is that the world is not as it should be. We are not as we should be. And the root cause of that is what it calls sin, which just overflows from the fact that I put myself before I put God and before I put everyone else. I am self-centered. That is the root cause of sin and then everything else flows out of that. But the weird thing is, it's not always like that. That's the strange thing, isn't it? Like, because that's not the only thing the Bible says about us. He says, the first thing God says about us is that you are good. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God called you out of nothing for something which is to be loved. He created you. He gave you a body, which is good. He gave you the ability to receive love. We, are, we carry this brilliance in us, but we also carry this brokenness in us. And we live as this mysterious mix of brilliance and brokenness. And a great definition of sin I love is that if there were two of you, they wouldn't get along. If there were two of you, they wouldn't get along. There is a brilliance in us and there is a brokenness in us. And we often act as our own worst enemy. And yet, while we were God's enemy, while we were each other's enemy, while we were treating ourselves as an enemy, Jesus died for us because he loves us. Because as this Psalm says, you are with me. See, the table Jesus prepares in the presence of our enemies, which includes us, includes our sins, includes all the things we've done wrong in the past, all the mistakes of the future. In the presence of all of that, 
He is with us and he wants to eat with us. And that's a picture of family. It's a picture of friendship. It's a picture of communion. It's a picture of relationship, of being shame-free, of being free from the past and having a future open towards us. And the fact that he eats with us shows that he's committed to the now you and not only to the future you. The fact that he eats with you now shows that he's not only like wants to be with you with the finished you, but he's also willing to be with the broken you, the blemished you, the bruised you. He wants to be with you today and eat with you today. But the fact that he prepares a table and gives you food shows that he's also committed to the future you as well. Like, um, uh, when we feed our kids, um, we do it to give them fuel for the day. But we're also doing it to help them become who they will be tomorrow and in the future. Like it says, it said that you are what you eat. That's why nutrition is important. It's why at Safe Haven, we don't, just do, uh, we don't just do food. We try and make sure it's nutritious and delicious because it's important because it's not just that you are what you eat. It's, it's almost maybe better to say you are becoming what you eat. And Jesus wants to change us. He wants to lead us into life in all its fullness. And so he speaks into our life. And that's not because he's a spoil sport. Actually, it's the opposite. It's because he's committed to the future you. You know, Jesus's limits are only ever given to us today against things that would limit us in the future. And there's more life in Jesus' limits than there is in the world's apparent limitlessness. You know, Jesus' current prohibition is his future provision. And he provides for us today because he's committed to the now you, but he's also committed to the future you. And he gives us food. And it's just such an incredible image, isn't it? Because he doesn't want to change us. Like Jesus doesn't tend to change us in a destructive way. He tends to change us in a regenerative way, not from pressure from without, but regeneration from within. Because when you eat food, your body absorbs it and it literally becomes part of you. And he gives us his friendship. He gives us his food. He gives us, you could think of the Bible as a table that has been prepared for us. As you read this, you'll, you'll encounter him. You'll get the wisdom you need for life. You'll get the power you need to live in that life. It's a table prepared. And as we sit at it each day, Jesus says, this is like daily bread. Best not just have a big feast once a year. Eat it little by little, day by day. And as you sit at this table prepared for us, you will encounter him. And the most important provision that he provides is forgiveness. Because this opens up the way to have a friendship that's free of our past, is free of shame, and gives us everything we need. And as he does this, the way he does this shows that he's also committed to the past you. Because when we become friends with Jesus, it's not that he says, let's not talk about the past. Let's just pretend it didn't happen. He looks fully at our past. He understands our past more than we understand our past. And he says, not only will I look at it, I'll take responsibility for it. And he goes to the cross. Because this table that has been prepared is not just a poetical table in David's mind. It's not just a metaphorical table. It was an actual table. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat down at a table with his friends and the whole city was his enemy around him and the next day would turn on him. And even his friends around his table, they thought they were for him, but they were against his mission. They wanted something else and it's actually their enemies against his purpose. And also sat at that table is Judas, the friend who would betray him. And Jesus sits at that table in the presence of his enemies And he doesn't just provide for himself, he provides for us. And that is a picture of our forgiveness. And then Jesus goes to the cross as a result of all those enemies. And on the cross, in the presence of the greatest enemies of sin and death, the Father provided for his Son. He provided for him resurrection life, and not just for him, but a cup that overflows into our lives and into the world as well. 
Jesus prepared a table for us in the presence of our sin and he invites us to come and feed it. And do you know what? It's so amazing. We will spend our whole lives trying to understand what is going on with the cross, how the cross works. And Jesus knew that we would struggle with it. And so he says, do you know what? You don't have to understand every bit. You just have to receive. And he says, this is the way you're gonna do it. He says, you're gonna act it out in a way that retells this story. And that's what communion is. That's what communion is. It's being invited to a table. And because Jesus was willing to drink the cup of eternal suffering, we can drink the cup of eternal blessing. In Jesus, you can be fully forgiven. You are fully free. And the story of your life can end well. And actually... It will never end because as David says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. We're now gonna act this out. We're gonna celebrate communion. So if you'd like to remain seated and we're gonna say the words as they come up on the screen. His, the Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through Christ your Son, our Lord, and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and he gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and he gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you, in remembrance of me. This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We say together, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Heavenly Father, proclaiming his saving death and resurrection and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect sacrifice. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat this bread and drink this cup, renew us by your spirit inspire us with your love and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom we worship you, Father Almighty. And so as our Saviour taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.